good morning, everyone. Um, uh, on behalf of the Saudi TESOL, I would like to uh, welcome all our attendees today for our first event uh, that is hosted by uh, Saudi TESOL. Um, I would like to welcome um, our uh, speakers today. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, uh, our international speaker from uh, different um, uh, countries um, uh, who have been teaching for many years and they are here to share uh, uh, their knowledge with you. Uh, we are very happy uh, that you have become a member of Saudi TESOL. Um, uh, our aim is to uh, contribute professionally to this um, uh, field of, of, uh, of and serve teachers around the kingdom and beyond. Um, uh, today events uh, is uh, our first and hopefully we will have more uh, to come. Um, um, I hope that you find uh, uh, some great ideas out of these sessions. We also would like uh, you to share your thoughts uh, on, on uh, Twitter, on the hashtag Saudi uh, TESOL. Um, we would like to spread the word to other teachers in the kingdom uh, of Saudi Arabia about our events, about the ideas you've uh, learned uh, today. Um, my colleagues, uh, Ian, uh, because he will be moderating the sessions today. He will be introducing the, uh, he will be introducing uh, the uh, speakers to you as well. Uh, so uh, back to you, uh, Ian, please. Thank you, Dr. Soki. A lovely introduction. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to jump in straight away and introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Christopher Taylor. Uh, Chris has had extensive experience as a teacher, an academic manager, and a CELTA and DELTA teacher trainer for longer than he cares to remember. It's possibly over over two decades, isn't it, Chris, I think? Uh, he's worked, is it more than two decades as a Delta trainer? Well, yes, well, I mean, not far no, off, for, so, for sure, yes. Okay. I guess my age now here, but yes. Um, he's worked in the UK, he's worked overseas, he's uh, covered a wide range of teaching and learning contexts at all levels and a range of specialist groups. His work as an educator has included teacher training Within both the fields of private and public education, he has collaborated with publishers, including Macmillan, as a materials writer for a series of English language course books. He also works as an external assessor for Delta Module 2 and Delta Module 3 for Cambridge Assessment. I think Chris and Jason later are both looking at ways we can help some of our learners uh, find the motivation that they need to to meet with success in their studies so uh, without any more further ado i'll hand straight over to to christopher taylor thank you chris thank you very much ian i'll just uh share my screen and we can get started sorry let's try the other one Well, thank you very much for the introduction there, Ian. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's exciting to be part of the launch of Saudi TESOL and to be invited to speak to all of you today. Um, so thank you for having me here. Um, just before we get started, um, just a little bit about the session as well. Um, I think, actually, I think I'm going to just put my full screen on, sorry, just to make sure you're not distracted by anything which is at the bottom of the screen. So let's try that one more time. Oops, a bit easy. That's better. Good. Um, so as I was saying, just for the session itself, if there are, are any questions really about uh, anything that comes up from the entire session, I will have a question and answer session at the end of my talk, uh, around about 10 minutes for that. Um, of course, if there are um, burning questions through throughout the session, then I will try and field those as I can, but I'll try and save most of the questions until the end. And I'll read that from your chat box 
and had and that as part of the discussion at the end of the session. Um, there will be points during the talk where you will be able to uh, interact. I'll welcome some comments and, and thoughts as well and your opinions. So it will hopefully be a bit more of an interactive uh, webinar session as well for today, just to say. And also just um, a couple of things about the session as well before we begin. Um, now, the question of course is why flip learning? Well, later on, we're going to look at the aims of the session, but really what this aims to do is, of course, all of us, um, yourselves and ourselves, myself included as educators, we've been certainly affected by the pandemic since March of uh, this year and trying to find um, creative ways to engage learners and to motivate them and to ultimately um, score successes with their English language learning. I think that's what, um, that's where flipped learning comes into this really to look at how we can that later. before we get started, um, look at how that applies to the English language classroom, you know, in terms of uh, looking at what content gets flipped, um, what remains within the classroom, how the two complement each other. Um, looking at maybe some of the challenges, including maybe some criticisms um, for, you know, aimed perhaps uh, against flipped learning, how to maybe counter those as teachers and educators. And looking at opportunities as well, which is, the main thrust really of the session is how to benefit our learners and how to um, get that balance between learning and teaching, I think, within this approach. Then looking finally at some practical examples in terms of activities, in terms of um, how to set up explanations, uh, access to resources and materials to help facilitate us uh, as educators um, posting flipped content online. And then looking at, of course, if there's further reading you want to know a little bit more about and take away from the session, then I can direct you um, there later on. Good, so first off, um, we get to get some reactions. Now this is where we can so use our chat box options if we can. Um, first of all, try to know what we understand by flipped learning. And I'd like you to type any ideas that you have into the chat box just to see to elicit what we know already. And then I'll try and add to that um, to begin with. So over to you, fire away. Let's, uh, let's see in the chat option, feel free to look at, to please type any messages in the chat box or the Q&A, I think, box it will be. Any, any response you have will be great. So let's see what comes up. Good. Hello, hi, Lena. Great. Good, thanks for that, Abraham. Let's see. Oh, that's great. Great, excellent. Um, really, really good. So good change of teachers' roles. Teachers facilitate was great. Mixture of virtual learning and face-to-face -face learning, yes, although it could also be done, of course, in the virtual world, the face-to-face -face aspect, as we're, we're doing as well. Uh, technology in the classroom, yes, that can certainly benefit the classroom as well. Um, good, allowing learners to do activities at their own pace. Thank you for that, Dr. Ennis. Um, good. She and our students do the work at home and come to class to discuss it. That's, um, yeah, good, good. Good, Afra, um, flip teacher means having more than one teacher for a course. That could certainly happen. It doesn't um, exclude team teaching for sure. Um, blended learning, yes, it is a type of blended learning. Uh, Wild and Ashrad, that's great. Really good. Um, Mohammed, this is great. It's good to see, good to tap into this, this knowledge uh, that you have here. Uh, students know in advance the content is going to be discussed in, in the classroom. Well, that certainly is helpful. And I would certainly recommend that. Face-to-face uh, -face plus online. Flexibility of learning, good. One of the pillars of um, flipped learning we're gonna look at later, which is great. Good, this is all really good stuff. Um, transferring some of the classroom stuff to be done at home earlier, good. Good, Mahmoud. Um, blended learning, good, good. Sharing materials with students prior to lesson. Keep the discussion at class time, good. So to maximize communicative learning, that's great. 
good student-centered. These are all excellent ideas. Uh, students replace teachers. I like that. Yes. Yes. In fact, bringing content into the classroom that they are experts on or they have an interest in. I think that's really important aspect to that as well. That's brilliant. Um, good. Nice. Very, very nice definition there, Osma. Um, mode of classroom uh, pedagogy, which shifts the roles of the student from the classroom to the home. Good. Good, good. And, and so many ideas, I can't pick out each and every one of you, but just I think you've, good, good. Some really nice thoughts there. Thank you very much for sharing those. I haven't got a chance to go through each and every one, but I think it gives a really good um, grounding in what you have. And I just wanted to see where we were at with some of our reading and some of our grounding there. So thank you. Thank you very much. And good, also in some of the Q&A boxes as well. Thank you very much, Hani. Um, good. Flip learning is an approach that blends face-to-face -face interaction and classroom with independent study outside of it. It's good, often through being assigned video content. Very nice. Um, teaching traditional, online teaching, traditional teaching. Good, sort of blended aspects. Razan, uh, thank you. That's excellent. Good, good. I'm going to go on because we, I mean, I'm sure we could just look at the definitions probably for most of the session because there's so much content there, but well done. But what we're going to do is very quickly look at some brief um, definitions. Um, as Harrison puts it, um, it's really... As some of you are talking about this kind of reversal process of what is perhaps thought of to be in the traditional classroom setting and then more uh, flipping that to be in the online setting, i.e. perhaps the, the self-study materials, maybe the instruction that the teachers might deliver in the class would then be perhaps put online, i.e. any kind of setting up of context that we might have through a text, any kind of um, in terms of language explanation, and this kind of thing, guided discovery, whether it's inductive approach or, or otherwise, putting that aspect prepared by the teacher into the self-study materials online, uh, possibly through the medium of Blackboard, uh, as we would have on an online platform, and then having them access that before we then go into the class with, on a follow-on lesson, where the, the homework element, if you like, the extended practice element, can exist more within the classroom. And as we're going to look at today, the key element of this is that it allows the teacher and us as educators to foster a more communicative classroom space, allowing more time for practice of language, discussion of language, making sense of it, evaluating what the students know from that as well, so reviewing that target language, and allowing for ultimately more meaningful, self-centered, um, freer practice. So that's, that's the aim. Um, that's where we're going with this today. Um, now, how did it begin? Well, it only uh, began life very humble origins uh, over 10 years ago, back in 2007. Bergman and Sams were the um, creators of this. In fact, they, um, they were simply high school teachers at the time, and they were frustrated, if you like, by students not being able to make sessions and, in fact, perhaps getting behind in the curriculum. So in order to address that, they accessed screen capturing software to record the lesson, record the lectures, so that students could um, access that on any device in their own time and then get up to speed with the course content. Of course, it began in high school, but of course, now, in fact, it's used most widely, um, especially in tertiary institutions worldwide, including universities and other institutions, and largely with an ELT. So certainly that's, that's, that's really taken a shift from general educational institutions to, to ELT worldwide. That's a very brief introduction. Now, before we go any further, let's, I wanna see, again, you had some excellent definitions. So just to see what can we flip in the classroom? In other words, what content can we put online? So again, any ideas in the chat box would be welcomed and you, you started off so excellently. So let's, let's borrow the shared knowledge and see where we can go with this. So into the chat box, a couple of minutes and let's see so many definitions from before, it's excellent. Yes, grammar explanations, a video, yes. Yes, certainly, Th thanks Thanks for that, Ephra. Short lecture, really good. Good, teachers can send recorded videos, notes, absolutely, to help there, thank you for that. Uh, good, Sam, sort of PowerPoint, yes, PowerPoint presentations, possibly, uh, with instructions if needed. Fahad, yes, sub skills, good, uh, I like that. Good, um, we'll, we'll expand on it a little bit later as well. PBL, great, yes, we're gonna be looking at it a little bit later on, of course. Uh, MISA, readable, flexible content, I like that. References, Ahmed, that's good book references. Um, yes, I mean, certainly homework. Again, if it's guided to what the homework they're doing, that could be good topics for discussion. Uh, yes, although that could certainly 
um, come back into the classroom. So that's great. Uh, exposure, YouTube links, Archimed, yes, certainly, all of this. Um, good. Resources, yes, we'll go specify that a little bit later, Rafida, Rafida but that's great. Um, good, Mohammed, you know, loading daily assignments and constellation of issues taught during the day. Great, so it looks like some of you are already implementing maybe some of the aspects of flip learning, which is great. Um, good online quizzes, I like that, yes, certainly. I, some of the iTools as well, some of our course books, I think, can uh, help for that as well. Visual aids, Hesse, that's great. Um, I like that. Some very step-by-step -step guides there from Mohammed. Thank you very much. And then the Q&A as well. Some definitions there. Blooms, very nice. Good. Good. In control preferences, reading content. That's great. Hatra, this is excellent. Great. Good. So just really um, going along with that as well and adding to the excellent ideas that you had. Um, um, Really all of the above, uh, I think. So it's excellent that we're potentially even using some of this already, if not um, primed with the knowledge of it. Um, any stages of a lesson plan where perhaps that might involve setting up a context uh, for the later analysis of language, whether it's grammar, vocabulary, uh, whatever that might be, um, or maybe allowing for the focus of receptive skills. For example, traditionally we might have the engagement of learners where we're activating the schemata, getting on topic. Um, we may well be able to do that with some discussion questions as some of you said, but more likely than not, we're looking at perhaps reading or listening text or re recording, perhaps for gist or specific information to set the scene um, before we then um, go on to maybe looking at some of the, the study of language. Um, perhaps then, uh, brainstorming, maybe first drafts, the writing tasks, maybe essays, descriptions, and reports. Um, so again, where we can come to the lesson uh, with that draft that we can then explore and peer review and you know, going beyond the idea stage. Um, and of course, explanations of target language, which you're going to look at some practical examples a little bit later. Um, so as some of you have quite rightly said, it could be videos that you yourself have recorded. Um, it could be, um, perhaps sourced already online. We're going to look at some resources later to help you with that as well. Or maybe some what we might call guided discovery tasks where you're uh, eliciting perhaps meaning, form, pronunciation, if you do have recorded uh, examples of target language, but more likely than not meaning and form, predominantly uh, with some carefully guided questions in an inductive approach or, or otherwise. So again, these could be some, some very targeted um, in the questions to guide them to the meaning. Good, this is great. Um, I'm, I'm so far the level of knowledge that we have already amongst our educators um, in the webinar, so thanks for all of that. Um, but moving on is what can we do in the classroom after flipped content? So in other words, we've shared the video content, we've looked at um, the, the meaning content, the form content, we reset the scene, and now we're back in the classroom. So what, what can be done in the classroom? How can we perhaps maximize that practice of language that we talked about um, earlier on? So again, over to you, just to share ideas, and, and it's great to learn from each other. It's great to have all of these, and I, I love the interaction we've had so far. Discussion, thank you, Gamal, that's great. Sharing ideas in groups, Nada, that's, that's yes, for sure, absolutely. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Peer review, which is excellent. Uh, discuss their notes, yes, yes, Sarah, that's really good, going going from the, the context that we had earlier. Uh, sharing and feedback, Abdul Karim, thank you. Uh, Hassan, uh, questions about the content, very good. Micro teaching, yes, excellent. Um, you know, evaluating as well. Um, my Sir, thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, good breakout rooms, discussing discussing questions. Hesso presentations, yes, indeed. Um, I like that. Give students the will, guide them. That's excellent, Saad. Saad. Uh, Samira, yes, review and discuss their own work. Um, good, yes, brilliant. So a lot of discussion, feedback, con correct concept. Yes, indeed. So evaluating the language that we're, that we're exposed to, that's great. And just before we go there, um, again, we've got, yes, role plays, reader, um, that's excellent. Uh, reading content, how do I get, okay, fine. Good. So just a little look at some of the things that happen in the classroom then, um, from what we were saying. Um, so yes, absolutely. It could be the discussion of the flipped content. So, um, you know, any points of instruction that you gave in the video, the lecture, um, the guided discovery, um, whatever was there, um, the 
perhaps iTools that you may well have got from um, course books, such as English Unlimited, whatever you're using, um, you know, and they have questions and you want to, or you, you, you yourself might plant carefully um, targeted questions, perhaps for discussion breakout rooms or whole class um, or polls um, for the learners to go over again. So you've got that, that discrete moment for them. Uh, any practice of language, of course, as well. Um, which could range from quizzes. I know as part of your ongoing assessment um, at the university, you would certainly have quizzes um, at the end of a, a, a chunk of learning, um, but this could be discrete to the lesson itself. Um, you could self devise it. We'll have a look at some other examples later as well. Uh, interactive control practice where they are discussing maybe what could be missing in certain uh, sentences or contexts, uh, sentence transformation perhaps, and uh, this kind of thing as well. Um, information exchanges, um, whatever it might be, provide a context, they provide the language so, and all that kind of thing. Student presentations, of course, as we said, um, I, I love the fact that you came up with, um, you know, students as teachers bringing content that they are, they can take ownership of and they can become the experts of. So, uh, you know, or things that you guide them towards. Uh, discussions, of course, debates, project work, more of that later. Um, as we said, in terms of writing sub skills, um, you know, they've, they've got the first draft, they've got the brainstorming, they've got the content, um, but this could be as we're talking about peer review, redrafting, uh, because a good writer doesn't just work in a vacuum, you know, they certainly would borrow good ideas um, from peers and they would add to that and they would, um, you know, edit the work together, there's only discussing of editorial um, selection or that process um, in terms of their choice of vocabulary, in terms of how to make it more ambitious, uh, any organizational aspects in the form, uh, any um, complex structures that they might want to, to add to have the range of language as well, um, anything pertinent towards the particular genre that we're looking at in terms of content and, and structure. So any of those really. And again, obviously, bottom up processing where uh, you may be familiar top down, perhaps more like the you know the overall gist, you know, the bigger picture of the text if it's listening or reading. But bottom up processing, of course, would allow us to look a bit more at the detail, whether it's reading between the lines, maybe not not what's said, but what's actually meant, maybe the more pragmatic look at the text. Um, also, perhaps looking at certain aspects of, of detail in terms of inferring meaning from context, um, looking at discourse relationships, uh, looking at different because particularly when we're looking at academic texts, it can be very useful to look at uh, reference that are made. How do we make the jump between um, paragraphs and different sections in a text and, and contextual clues, that kind of thing as well. Um, so any of that context certainly can be, um, can be highlighted. Uh, another way to look at um, flipped learning is to compare and contrast it to, I'm sure a lot of you um, from your teacher training and your background, you'd be familiar um, with the traditional PPP, which is present, of course, practice and production. Now, of course, the present part might be traditionally the teacher uh, presenting something, setting the context, um, looking at, at models of target language, uh, then focusing on clarification of language, like meaning, form, pronunciation. Then, of course, looking at control practice, as we discussed, and freer practice, the further consolidation of language. Um, if we look at this model further, what flip learning allows us to do is perhaps to take the present aspect um, as the flipped content, um, maybe recorded instruction, as we said, um, online tasks, whatever that might be to guide the learner to, to, to the meaning and the form and possibly pronunciation. Uh, but in class, it will be the practice and production of language, of course, which is key and which is fundamental here uh, in that particular model. So pictorially, if that helps us to um, consolidate that a bit more. And uh, again, another way of looking at this would be, of course, looking at the four pillars. It has been said, maybe four pillars of flip learning and looking at the word flip as an acronym. So F in flip, of course, is for flexible environment. Um, with this, uh, not just that learners can take things at their own pace and we are flexible to learners looking at the content online, whatever device they have in the time that they have, which is suitable for them. Um, but also uh, being flexible as teachers, you know, looking in terms of how we assess learners and you know, how, we, how we look at language, uh, language learning and language explanations. Uh, learning culture, now this is key to the flip model, as with any learning, that we put learning at the heart of everything that we do uh, in our learning and teaching paradigm. You know, that we allow, in terms of the activities that we do, we allow these critical moments to happen, these critical learning moments to happen where we address learning 
learning needs, which maybe come from the online content. We uh, look at ways that we can uh, bring out um, meaning. We can use different stages in the lesson, of course, to, to facilitate communication and growth. Intentional content, eyes for intentional content, looking at from us as educators, as lesson planners, as teachers, we are selecting, making the difference, if you like, between what can they manage as independent learners in self-study access for the fit content and what needs guidance and what can be done within the classroom to perhaps maximize that um, meaningfulness and that personalized language practice in class. And lastly, P is for professional educator, in terms of which all of us are, um, an array of experience that we bring to our learners, that we bring um, to our situations. In terms of the different roles, I, I think what I like, someone one was mentioning the role of the teacher. And this last point looks at the roles that we have as teachers, as educators, in terms of facilitator, um, ob observing what learners need in terms of um, highlighting, instructing, directing um, errors or, or things that we can, we can push learners in the directions where they need to go. And I think particularly in flip learning, it demands a certain kind of uh, teacher assessor to, to, although taking a back, whilst taking a back seat, you're very much um, driving the learning and being that role of facilitator, a teacher. So flip. Now, as I said earlier, uh, I'd like to look at challenges before I go into look at opportunities, because I think it's good um, to look at how we can address these, because with the best planning in the world, sometimes we do need to anticipate the things that might challenge us if we are using this approach. Um, so first of all, first question is, what if the students don't review the flip content at home before the follow on lesson, which, of course, could happen? You know, we set them a task to do in their own time. And then this doesn't quite, this doesn't quite happen. Um, so for example, one possible solution could be the students or students can independently go through the flipped input in class. So you can give them that content, um, share the link, direct them to the location in Blackboard, for example, where it exists on that platform. Um, Better still, you can put the student or students in breakout rooms with other students who have completed those tasks in the flipped content and maybe have them explain the content so they become learner facilitators. And that can be quite motivating for those who have actually looked at the content, can be a good way for those who've uh, accessed that content to try and review it themselves and make sense of it themselves while they're explaining it to their peers. And while at the same time, those who have looked at the content can then perhaps um, simply review the content with their peers so they can make sense of what content was shared um, on that online platform, the flipped content. You may also want to, um, depending on your credit systems work, you may also want to introduce a credit system uh, which can be implemented. Um, again, motivating students further to complete those input tasks before the lesson so that they, they get a certain credit there for, for um, uh, motivation, again, for attainment and, and achievement. So that's something to think about in terms of how to address that. Um, sometimes there are certain uh, criticisms, one of which um, understandably so, um, could be that flipped learning is simply a substitute for in-class instruction, um, you know, taking that away from the teacher um, outside of the, the, the lesson. Um, however, by flipping these, the, the input stages then and, and having the access online, um, this means, of course, that we are able to prioritize learning needs. They've accessed it, they've gone through the instruction, the input, they're bringing it with them to the lesson. And in fact, as I said earlier, with well-targeted questions, teachers can then in a follow-up lesson, uh, gauge where the students are with their, with their knowledge level. And then what can be focused on is only essential instruction, um, therefore maximizing time for practice of language. Um, and again, of course, as, as we would, be quick to point out, and as I'll, I'll address at the end as well, um, I would say that this approach would be more of a, a complement um, to perhaps our more conventionally structured ELT lessons, um, having each of the stages within um, the synchronous learning, the uh, in-class learning. 
online and perhaps hopefully face to face soon. Um, so it's only implemented when needed. So this is more what we're given today is more of a suggestion. It's more of a compliment rather than uh, this is something which is to replace our existing teaching practice um, to be trialed out, if you like. And I think one of the most important points about learning and teaching is that it can be empowering for students to take ownership of their own learning. Um, we'll go into that a little bit more in a second, looking at opportunities, but, but where they can, you know, I think being very used to accessing content online, um, young adults, adults, um, adult learners, it takes that um, process further with flipped learning where you are giving them the opportunity to then um, access content um, take their time over that, uh, re replay any content that's needed uh, until they are really sure. You know, I think one of the assumptions is that, you know, when we are de uh, delivering lessons that everyone does learn at the same um, pace. And, and in that sense, you know, that can be empowering, not only before the class, but also during the class where um, they can ask further questions and that they can again show that knowledge um, to each other. So we've looked at challenges. So that brings me to my next point of opportunities. Now, again, with, with each other, I'd like you to share with each other in the chat. Uh, what do you think are some of the opportunities with learning and teaching with flipped learning? Because this is where what we want is a take home uh, from today's session. So let's see uh, what some of the ideas are. Maybe some of us have used it. Maybe some of us have any thoughts. Now uh, what we can do. Great. Uh, oh, these ideas came from previously, good. So good, excellent creativity for sure. I think so creativity from both the students and the teachers point of view for, for designing materials there as well. Exchange information. So Hassan, thanks for that. And Kose, that's great. Um, good promote learning autonomy. Excellent. Uh, Alina, good shared experiences for sure. A very important one there. Thank you. Um, rediscovering students' abilities and skills. Galia, that's great. Uh, Afra, accessibility for the content. Um, Self-esteem. Yes, indeed. Accomplish a lot in a limited time. I agree, it's, it can be a very uh, efficient way sometimes of, of bringing this into the classroom. Uh, El Habib, thank you for promoting technological aspects of learning. Yes, indeed, uh, as a compliment, um, for sure. Um, let students independent, become independent about their learning. Thank you, thank you, Nuf, that's great. Um, excellent, and let's see if there are any, okay, I think most are in the chat, that's great. I don't think there are any in the Q&A just for now. And uh, just have a quick look there as well. Good. Good, that's great. Good. Good. Thanks for that. Good, I'll, I'll get some of these questions at the end as well that are coming up, so that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So from here, um, good. Certainly for opportunities, uh, plenty to look at here, um, but just a handful, not an exhaustive list here. Um, certainly gives learners the chance to work at their own pace, I think, as we might have mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, this is a really safe space for learners here, so they can replay video input content, um, you know, that you've delivered for them um, at their own pace. If there's anything they didn't quite get the first time around, uh, they can reread text. They can use a dictionary if they want to. Again, there isn't. They haven't got the pressure of time. Um, check meaning uh, where, where needed. You know, playing back the listening tasks again. Um, you know, this kind of thing. Um, you can even have tape scripts there. If you want to audio scripts, you know, that can be a very useful thing to have. Um, good, certainly reviewing the flipped input, um, maybe any follow-up lesson. This allows them to receive help. So as I said, with specific learning difficulties. Um, so you know the knowledge that they have and you can address the real knowledge gap there in terms of uh, maybe you're delivering any content they already know. Um, extending their learning further in breakout rooms and whole class discussions with pinpointed questions, ideally. Um, and I think here that it's what we want to look at and what we want to, to go towards, and I think a lot of you have really hit on, this creativity uh, aspect of more of a communicative classroom. We're going to look a little bit later in some of the sessions, of course, at uh, more practical examples of activities. Um, I will share a few of you uh, with you later. But here we've got uh, ideally allowing more opportunities for, for freer speaking, for uh, student interaction, for collaboration. Um, this is where we want to be at, I think, with, the, with our lessons, with flip learning. And as I said, one of the things we really want to do, um, as Ian and myself said earlier on, is I think to look at, in doing so, uh, increase the chance of motivation 
um, you know, because we're, we're centering it around them. We're putting them at the heart of what we do in our planning and preparation and our delivery. Uh, the knowledge that we have of their interests, of their motivation of, as to why they're learning English, bringing all of this in to our design of tasks, um, to the student participation and interaction, which we hope and we trust has the ultimate goal of um, increasing student achievement. And again, looking at further opportunities here, of course, as well, um, looking at some examples of communicative speaking activities, which I will look in a little more detail in uh, just a moment. Um, but from here, so certainly we've got, uh, as I say, collaborative group tasks, um, such as, again, we've got ranking. So again, we'll look at that a bit more in a moment, um, the kind of language that we can use for that as well. Uh, designing, which I'll, I'll show an example of in just a moment, and possibly planning as well. Um, these can be all good collaborative tasks. Discussions or debates, um, again, a, a really useful one for you know, setting that up for the class as well, which we'll look at. Web quests, certainly which we will um, give an example of in just a moment, where of course the learners will have to go, um, go online and bring something um, preferably to the lesson, or it can be during the lesson, but probably would need more time to research. Um, and as we were saying, maybe search for things where they are, they, they become the experts, they become the teachers, if you like, the facilitators of that in the lesson itself. And ongoing project work, uh, as we were saying, um, perhaps such as, you know, writing of brochures, leaflets, maybe uh, newspaper writing. Of course, and the brochure aspect can be uh, really quite a fun one. It could be, of course, designing a brochure, um, you know, for the, the language institute, maybe for and where they are studying, why should you come and study here, looking at different aspects of facilities and maybe the, the teaching and all of that as well, the social aspect of it. Uh, newspapers are a great one, certainly. Um, that can become quite a lengthy project when you've looked at all the different text types and genres within uh, a newspaper, not just an article or report writing, um, but again, perhaps looking at some human interest stories, um, perhaps again, looking at uh, other aspects um, within the newspaper as well, opinion pieces, you know, that kind of thing, agony aunt, all these kinds of things, you know, can be put um, within a newspaper as well. Now, some of the application to the ELT class, I'm just going to, in this section, just look at, guide you to, towards maybe some of the resources that some of you might be using already um, to record and, or to access recordings of uh, flipped content um, to help our learners. Um, so here, so if you are um, looking for resources to search for uh, relevant flipped video content, uh, you could use the following sites. Um, Khan Academy is one, it's a non-profit organization there, which uses um, a lot of free content, which you can have access to uh, once you sign up, sign up for them, and I certainly recommend that. TED Ed, of course, the educational branch of TED Talks. Uh, which some of you may well um, be following and using anyway, again, to search for uh, instructional texts there and content. Uh, YouTube, but of course, do use with caution, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. Um, a lot of the content, of course, on YouTube is, you know, we do need to be careful about quality control. Um, do look at all of the video content very carefully. Uh, does it, in fact, look at the aspect of language that you are dealing with, because um, there could be more, uh, more than one functional use of language that doesn't necessarily match the lesson or content that you want to have back in the classroom. So again, so in terms of the content itself, in terms of the professional uh, gloss of it, do, do use that with caution, but certainly there is content out there. Um, in terms of also further application, we can also look, if you want to create your own videos, if you are feeling more creative, and I know this is slightly more time intensive, but it can be a lot more rewarding if occasionally you do this. Um, of course, you can use uh, your own devices to do this. It can be a simple um, video from a phone or a tablet of you uh, in the classroom uh, delivering perhaps a, a, a simple presentation either on a projector or on a whiteboard that's fine, um, that works well. But if you do want to use software tools as well, or applications, videos, broadcasts, you could use uh, Jing, certainly. I mean, all of these are actually um, screen capturing, uh, screencasting software 
that um, do have very similar features. So Jing is one of them, uh, Cam Studio is certainly another, uh, which I'd recommend to you. And lastly, uh, Screencast-O-Matic, which um, actually this, this one tends to be used um, a lot more uh, frequently for flip learning. Um, so that might be the one of choice. You may want to start there, but certainly um, play around with trial and error. Uh, if you are feeling creative, as, as it says here with the, the filming, the editing and post-production, and then the final uploading of course onto your online platform and Blackboard. So those are just some things to consider. Now, from that, what I'd like to, to finish with before we have a look at um, any further reading and questions at the end, uh, is just to look at some practical examples of um, just very simple activities you could use with learners that wouldn't maybe take too much preparation uh, to put together to then share um, on our online platforms as flipped content. Um, I did mention, I'll just bring this down, I think so you can see that. Uh, I did mention guided discovery and uh, traditionally often guided discovery might come from uh, the context of a reading text or a listening text, but in this case, this reading text comes from the course book series Life if you are familiar with them. Uh, again, it's a course book series which can be used with young adults and adults as well. Um, and this is from Life Pre-Intermediate. And there was a reading text which was uh, about Apple and the brand of Apple and a brief history of Apple and uh, the, the company itself. And these contexts come from that. So we had, for example, an Apple product is recognized by people all over the world. The first Apple laptops were produced in 1999. So looking at the target language highlighted in red, um, of course, you might have a question which elicits a simple yes, no response or a 50-50 response, a very discreet response. For example, here, which sentence is the present simple form of the passive? And hopefully they would answer and they would can click on the answer. Sentence one is recognized. Which sentence is the past simple form? So again, hopefully they would click on number two. Um, when we use the passive, is the person or the action usually more important in this context of the action? So again, that's a, a pre-intermediate level. Um, you know, we're looking really, you know, A2, A2+, plus, B1. We're looking at a very simple definition of the passive before we're going into more complex notions of it. So it's really looking at um, the common denominator here, really, uh, looking to focus on the process rather than who does something. And here, again, if you want to... Um, focus on the agent using by, we can say when we use the passive, it's usually not important who does the action, but if we want to say who does it, what word comes before it? And of course, hopefully focusing on by in sentence one. So that, in terms of looking at the meaning, in terms of looking at form, uh, again, our context sentences, how do we form the passive in the present? And again, you've got of course, the subject, am is are plus past participles so and verb three, just to check they're okay for terminology, maybe illicit. You can have one or two examples there, what word, word three might be. Uh, how do we form the passive in the past? Again, subject, was, were, plus past participle, and then verb three. So again, we're looking at meaning, we're looking at form. As I said earlier, if you do want to, I mean, notions of pronunciation, you might want to bring in the classroom a little bit more because it's easier to, to perhaps drill. But here, you can have recorded excerpts of model sentences from target language if you want to, uh, which they can then elicit. Where's the stress and aspects of of um, reduced um, consonants there. So also in terms of um, further practice for consolidation, uh, as I mentioned before, quizzes uh, can be a great way of doing this. You can of course write your own quizzes, um, you know, whether it's things like you know, grammar auction where they have to, um, for points, they have to put a certain number of points on a sentence to see if it's right or wrong, and then decide from there um, if they're correct, then they get the points. If they double their points, if not, then they lose the points. But Bamboozle is also another very useful uh, application. You can design your own quiz. Some of you may be familiar with it already. Um, and here you divide in uh, however many uh, people in the class. You can select the number of teams there. They click on a square, then up to you how many questions you want. It could be one to 12, one to 16, or, or for a larger test. And each of those, squares would usually have a sentence that you've designed yourself, which could be have a missing word or have a sentence transformation. You give them a context, they have to give you um, the sentence which matches the context using the target language, that kind of thing. And of course they get points every time uh, you know, as a team they, they score. Um, in terms of team, if we're doing this online, uh, obviously we can't go into breakout rooms for this, but what we can do is use the breakout teams 
and still unmute the three, four, or how many people are in that team at that time to play together, to confer together as a team, and then to, again, either unmute it or to chat the answer uh, in the box, whichever works better for their learning context or environment. Uh, Kahoot, again, is another uh, very useful, really fun app, which depends how they are connected to your online class, because if they, if they are on Blackboard on the online lesson, um, of course, this works well if they are connected with another device, such as a laptop or a tablet, and then they have their mobile phone, which they are, which they can. They're given a PIN number once they join, then which they can join the game, and then they have to answer. Usually, they have a choice of four different answers, uh, one or two which could be correct. For example, this instance, this jacket is mm, for you. So big, too, too big enough big and big enough. And here they, they click on what they think on their phone. They would then have to put uh, the correct answer, the color or the, or the shape that they believe is the right answer in each case. Okay, so some of these you may well already be using, but certainly more fun ways of looking at control practice and consolidation of language before we go on to freer practice. And here are just some very, very simple, very brief ideas that again, it would be quite simple to put together, um, which you could adapt from, you know, whether it's English Unlimited or other materials as well, you could adapt from this. Uh, ranking, as I mentioned, was something we could look at, perhaps in this case, looking at Saudi Arabia's top five, where the Saudi Tourist Board has asked you to choose top, the top five places or things that tourists should visit or do in Saudi Arabia. And again, make a list of your top five places, activities, and present your ideas to the class. Now, some of these activities, of course, you could plant um, perhaps in images, some of their own students' interests there as well, um, and they can incorporate that into or maybe places that they'd be very familiar with as well. Um, you, they can incorporate that. And this ranking, of course, is really good because, again, as a group exercise in breakout rooms, uh, uses a whole horde of language there, of course, you know, in terms of, first of all, um, language of comparison, uh, justification of their choices, um, again, responding to the choices, agreeing, disagreeing, uh, having a general consensus at the end you know, of that session as well. So there's a lot of, lot of language which can be uh, perhaps pre-taught and this, this language can maybe perhaps be something you can put within the flipped content and have access to, and you can bring that and just discuss the final points of that before they then go into the lesson, for example. So that's one way to look at it. Uh, another, of course, is looking sometimes at web quests, so real or fake, where they can search an item of fake news. This is really good for their own uh, critical thinking, where they decide what is real and what is fake. I think when they're sourcing their um, <clears throat> when they're actually sourcing their materials, I think, academically to know, can they trust the different sources that they have access to online and to have a discerning eye on that? I think it's very important to have that, to start that early. So they would bring this into the classroom and present the news item. And they have to decide if it's real or fake news. Um, again, this one could be, a lot of us talked about presentations. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the BBC show Dragon's Den where um, again, you could show them in class, maybe an example of a video of that, where um, those of you who don't know it, it's based on the idea, the dragons are uh, multi-million or billionaire uh, successful entrepreneurs, and they are looking to invest their money wisely if you have the right idea of a product or a service. And uh, if you're lucky enough to, to win, then you manage to get their investment and that kind of thing. So you could introduce them to the idea. And here, of course, they could, you could give them the topics themselves, you know, in terms of what to produce. So what products could be used for the following things that could be, for instance, a piece of medical technology. Uh, it could be an innovation to protect against COVID-19, hence the COVID busters there. Uh, it could be an innovation that helps fight crime. So it could be one of these things where you could also potentially add a video there as well to give them to brainstorm ideas, um, you know, within, um, Perhaps that could be part of your own um, content where um, you are different entrepreneurs are giving their own ideas about um, COVID um, protection, for instance, you know, this kind of thing, uh, as well as other key language. And the key language that you could present now in, in the lesson beforehand, because this could go with more than one lesson as well, or uh, you could certainly outline some of the things that you're going to be doing, which is discussing maybe a need in the market, planning a product, 
would focus on some of these features as well, like function, design, uh, target market, and who's going to, to buy this and the cost involved, and maybe some claims. You know, what do you promise uh, to do for the customers? And, and some of this language, when they're finalizing their pitch, you might want to send them some of this in the flip content, looking at things such as key language uh, to have as a checklist, which they can maybe assess with each other when they're listening to each other's, each of the group's presentations. So it could be uh, to make it more personal, for example, language like you and we to make that connection with the audience. Language for emphasis, like one of the most innovative designs. So looking at superlatives, um, uh, again, hyperbole, that kind of thing. Adverbs as well, absolutely must have product, new present simple for facts. Uh, descriptive language, you know, will for promises, again, for claims we mentioned already, questions to make the audience think, have you ever been in this experience, you know, this kind of thing, linkers, like firstly, moving on to my next point, all these kinds of things, uh, you can, again, give them to remind them when they're drafting out their presentations and coming together, you know, for that, um, you know, post flipped lesson content. So those are just some things to think about. Of course, there are so many things you can do with this. And that's the great thing. That's the flexibility here uh, with this. So just to take it further before we have questions at the end of this, uh, any further reading? Um, a good place to start, of course, if you want to know where it all began, um, is, of course, Flip Your Classroom, Reach Every Student in Every Class Every Day, um, again by Bergman and Sams, the founders of uh, Flip Learning. So that's um, a good place to start. Looking for practical ideas there. Um, it's, the first of these, of course, is at university level, but again, it does have a more general ELT focus as well, including tertiary institutions. You've got um, Flip It Strategies for the ESL Classroom. And you've got flipping academic English language learning, perhaps for those who might be slightly higher level as well, and want to look at how to make flipped learning work for you and your lessons. A uh, couple of websites here um, that could, preside, could have resources and links, some of the ones that we were talking about here as well, to help you to support your flipped learning preparation and materials. So the Flip Learning Network Hub is one useful um, aspect to look at, and the flipped language learning resources as well that could be a place to um, direct your attention to. Great. So in terms of that, um, of course, there's so much that's been written on it, but that's certainly one to just to give a take of um, the reading that is, that is out there. Okay, thank you. So now I know there are some questions already within the chat. I know, I think we do have a, a, a few minutes um, for this, um, but let's just have this ready. Um, in terms of the questions that are here, I know there are quite a few questions there already and I'll try and read through them. And I'll, I'll try to get through as many as I can, but I'm mindful of course of allowing enough um, breathing space between myself and uh, we is going to follow me afterwards. So first of all, now I'll try and scroll back if I can in the Q&A and let's have a quick look, see where the questions are so if we can. Of course, you can feel free to add Okay, great, good. Good, fine. Okay, so we've got some technical questions there, but let's move on to, okay. Sassy Dar was talking about MPF. What does it stand for in the practice present production? So that was, that was meaning, form and pronunciation. So M is for meaning, P is for pronunciation and F is for form. That's just one more clarifying language. And that's what we'll be ultimately aiming for in the flip content online. And, okay, thank you for that, Sasida. And, good. Um, Saud, Saud says, uh, flip learning relies heavily on self-learning, which requires a certain level of competency. So how can you overcome the reality that some students are competent enough to self-learn themselves? Good, that's good. I think in terms of that, I think it really, rather than, um, thinking about the, the content, I think it's more, it's more a case of considering we as teachers and educators, I think we need to pitch the, the content sufficiently for our, our learners who are accessing the content. So um, perhaps if it's, um, if we are looking perhaps at an, um, you know, at an A1 or an A2 class, then it stands the reason that the questions that the, the context that we use, of course, hopefully will come from adaptive materials that we're already using with our learners or, or 
materials that we have written, which are at a level of the they're learning that I can respond to, which doesn't have um, too much language, which goes beyond the periphery of their learning. Um, and of course, I, I think part of it is knowing that, knowing our learners. Now, obviously this approach, it's, it's, a, it's a, a lovely um, add-on, if you like, that we can have for our learners, but in, it's not an approach. I think it's an approach that we know our learners best. We know what aspects of this will work with our learners. Um, and of course, we also have the responsibility to, if we have flipped the content, to then bring that back into the classroom with any questions and supporting learners in any way that we, we can have. So thank you, Sarah, that was a good question. Um, can't answer the question about certificate for attendance, but I'll, I'll leave that in good hands of the administrators of today. Thanks, Nanaja. Um, good, I like that. PPP, thinking, speaking, doing. That's, that's a good way of looking at side for the PPP. Um, good. Good. Uh, Faisal says, why is it that incidental learning can't, cannot be one of the pillars of flipped learning? I don't think it's, not that it can't be. Um, you know, I think there are quite a few aspects that could fit the eye of, of the FLIP. Um, I think that's just one way of looking at it, really. Um, so that's fine. Don't want to exclude any content there. I think whatever works for us as educators is fine. Um, Afaf says, what will I do if student appears without his preparation? Good. Um, so in turn, they didn't watch the video. I think if you go back to hopefully in the challenges um, aspect, I think that was one of the things we're looking at and trying to preempt that in the solutions comments I think I had earlier. So if you perhaps want to go back to that or the, if the video is archived, you want to play it back again over that section, hopefully that will answer. But essentially having students to team up in breakout rooms and peer teach and you know, peer evaluate, I think that could be a useful solution for that. Um, Ahmed Raza says, can flipped learning and inductive approach go parallel? For sure. Um, in fact, an inductive approach in our guided um, learning and our guided approach, um, you know, guided discovery rather, you know, we're trying to encourage that to try to elicit as much as we can. And we, okay, we trust of course that the learners are going to try and think of an answer first before they click on the answers, but you know, we, we are trying to set that up in an adaptive approach as much as we can. You know, putting learners at the heart of that, I think, is, is certainly important. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, how to handle large size, large class size of flipped learning, um, for sure. I'm not exactly sure how large we're talking about, um, Dr. Safa Asa, um, but certainly that, that would be a challenge. And I think, depending on our class sizes, I think that's something that we need to consider. Um, as I mentioned, it, it, it's, a, it's a very useful complement uh, flip learning, but it may not be appropriate for every learning and teaching situation. Um, so that's something I think to consider as, as a teacher yourself. You know your students best, you know your learning context best, you know whether or not to, to use that. You know, I think if, you know, if we're talking about 20, 30 students plus, um, then fine, it, you know, that, that could certainly, and in terms of them, you being able to go into breakout rooms in terms of them having enough student talk time, fine. Um, it doesn't mean to say that it doesn't work with larger, larger groups. So obviously, um, in terms of a, a discrete, finite period of time, of course, there, there, it may be, there may not be so much peer review and opportunity for discussion, um, certainly a whole class, but it's certainly something to consider. Um, Again, saying, okay, good, trying to have a balance because there's more than one question from, different, from the same person. So I'm trying to get a bit of a balance here. Um, good, good. Good, good. Thanks for that. Okay, quickly here. And I'm conscious of uh, how much more time do we have? Um, maybe we have another minute or two perhaps, but just uh, trying to get through as many of these as I can, because there's so many, uh, so many really good questions here. And I'm sorry if I can't get through all of your questions, because I'd love to have perhaps another half hour to go through all of these and just to just talk together, but let's see. So we have um, Elvin says, coming from a culture where independent study is non-existent, how can we motivate the students to work independently at home outside class and do the required work before the next class? Fine. Well, I think here, um, it's certainly a good preparation if we are being responsible as teachers and educators and we are looking for them to work towards the university study and education. Um, learner autonomy is absolute. If we look at a global model of um, certainly a, a university study, I think it's, it's something that we at the very least should be encouraging. Um, and it's something perhaps which might take a lesson or two 
to stick at the very least. But as I said, if we are giving incentives to them, maybe we are giving credit systems and motivations and, and you know, for them to actually do the work. So if we are incentivizing them to do that, then at least we're taking a step further to do that. It doesn't guarantee that they will do the work, um, but certainly perhaps if we do have positive reinforcement of that um, with um, these credit systems in place uh, for motivation, I think that can certainly help. Um, good, thank you for that, Elvin. Uh, Salim says, does, does flip learning bring bridge the gap between classroom and home? It certainly can do. Um, I think that's a good, um, a good question. Um, you know, I think especially now as we are, you know, we are, everything that we do is online and we can feel a bit disconnected sometimes. I think anything, if we can use that online platform in a way that does, does link well and cohesively with what the content that we do uh, face to face, if you like, or in the online synchronous learning moments. And I think uh, there is a bridge of sorts that, and I think the more we use that, perhaps the more familiar learners become, the more comfortable we are as teachers with that. I think it can certainly, um, can certainly help with that bridge. Um, just to say, Ian, um, where, where I am with time, because I do appreciate it's a little over 10, sorry, a little past 11, and I, I another, don't want to... Perhaps another 30 seconds, Chris. Okay, great. So let's have one more. Definitely time for one more then. Let's see. Um, good. In terms of Hassan Ahmadi says, in terms of assessment, in your opinion, what are the best question types for flip learning? Gosh, that's something can't answer in 10 seconds, I think. But, um, but certainly... Um, I think in terms of, if you go back to some of the things we were talking about, if it's, uh, if we're looking at in-class, in terms of assessment in-class content, I think if we're looking at freer practice uh, beyond restricted practice and control practice and quizzes, although quizzes are great, I think when they're using language, perhaps in a communicative way, in a, perhaps in a learner-centered way, and in a way which um, they can have extended speaking practice, even at a lower level, if they are, have opportunity to, to, for expended, extended practice of, even if it's 20, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, then that gives enough time. And also ones not just them talking by themselves, but collaborative practice where they are interacting, engaging each other, because that's a very important communicative skill. And I think if we're assessing that in terms of how they interact, in terms of their spoken discourse, in terms of um, that, you know, how they use the target language effectively in extended speech. I think that will build on their, their confidence and as an assessment tool, I think it worked very well. Thank you, Hassan. Probably that's what we have time for thinking, isn't it? Yes, so, right. That's great. Thank you very much, Christopher. That was fascinating. Thank you very much indeed.